Welcome back, everyone. I wanted to just touch on a few of the stanzas from uh, my new book, Trust and Awakening. And uh, I wanted to also take this time to thank Rick for his support of my teaching and books. He has been kind enough to write a blurb for each of my books. <clears throat> and I'll share his blurb he wrote for this one before going into the book. He wrote, with genuine spiritual and intellectual genius, Stephen Doetsu Snyder explores a revered Buddhist text in modern, radically liberating ways. I was jolted on every page with heart-opening joy at the good news of our true nature, the original nature of all things right under our noses endlessly renewed by its mysterious source. This is a magnificent breakthrough book that will be accessible and helpful to anyone at any point on their path. So obviously very kind words and I appreciate again his support very much. And so this is a book that uh, a poem that was originally uh, written in the seventh century in China, and it's been used by students in Chan and Zen and Buddhism in general to really see the path of awakening, to see where they might be in the path of awakening, to get some guidance, some solace sometimes. And I just felt that there could use a more modern translation and commentary, which is what I've done. So I've, in my uh, humble efforts, have tried to sharpen some of the stanzas to convey some of the realizations that are available on the path. And I'll just start by reading the first stanza. <clears throat> and these stanzas are all in four lines. Each line could really be taken as a as a kind of spiritual question, what we call a koan in the Zen tradition. So the first stanza, the great way is effortless with no preferences. Surrender desire and aversion, clarity dazzles. So the great way when it's referenced in Buddhism is talking about the path of practice, the path of realization. And to use the term effortless, uh, when we have effort, we have a sense of a doer, of a me who's doing something to get somewhere. And in fact, like in the meditation we just did, a lot of the meditation practice and spiritual practice is really letting go of control of doing and really beginning to rest more and more in the beingness that's here the second line with no preferences typically for most of us we have a fairly constant narration in our inner world and it's a narration identifying our likes and dislikes I like that car, I like that tree, I don't like those shoes. And by repeating and identifying our likes and dislikes, it's a way that we maintain our sense of self. I know who I am based upon what I like and what I don't like. And so this is saying with no preferences. The third line of trust and awakening is surrender, desire, and aversion. So we're really letting go of whatever we want that makes us feel like we're whole, like we're a complete person. The things that we feel we need in order to really be comforted. And the aversion is we want to keep away anything that we perceive to be negative or bad. So we're trying to constantly pull in the things we think are good 
and push away the things that we think are not good for us. And if we just simply surrender that desire and aversion, it opens us up to the clarity that can come from contact with the absolute, the clarity and precision can dazzle us. The next stanza I'm gonna read is stanza eight from Trust and Awakening. Unbind thought and concept, roam openly, inhabit the source, know all meaning. So unbind thought and concept, we maintain our sense of self and our view of the world through our thought process, our repetitive thinking, and through maintaining concepts. People, there's a way that they feel on some level that they're responsible for keeping the world in its place because there's a way for example like sonar i can look at something and say steven desk steven computer and it's like it it gives not only a name but it gives a location and a relationship by using concept but it keeps us out of the direct knowing whenever we're overly identified overly attached to our thoughts and concepts. So the unbinding is slowly releasing, letting go. What's it like to not turn to our thoughts or concepts for even a few moments? We can sometimes taste the freedom of that. The second line, roam openly. So roam within our interiority our inner landscape opening through the portal into the absolute. And the portal is our own consciousness, our own true nature. By slowing down, by letting go, by loosening the self-definition, we can drop into that inner spaciousness, the vastness that's always here. The third line of the stanza, inhabit the source. So the source is the absolute. And when I say inhabit, I'm meaning rest, be the source, be with the source, relax into it as we did in the meditation. There is a way through realization that we can have the absolute as our inner experience at all times. We can inhabit the source in that. We can inhabit the source when we make contact with our deeper or true nature. So resting in the truth of who we really are allows us to relax. And the fourth line, to know all meaning. It doesn't mean to know everything but it means to understand the meaning behind what we see, what we witness, what we experience. So knowing the deep meaning and seeing life and seeing ourselves as an expression of the absolute in this form, in this place. So know all meaning means simply to rest in the truth of who you are. And from that, intuitive knowledge can open up and we can understand how things work. I've got one more stanza and then I'll open it up for your questions or comments. This is stanza nine from the the book, Trust and Awakening. Awakening dawns, eclipse, form, and absence. No beginning, no end. Sever every opinion. 
So as we awaken, an awakening is really the absolute awakening to itself in this moment, in this location, in a particular consciousness, awakening dawns. The self, the personality doesn't awaken. What awakens is the absolute, the true nature in us is what awakens. So awakening dawns, and that is the felt sense. The felt sense is like seeing the darkness and just then a sliver of light from the sun begins to shine. And within a short time, the fullness of the magnificent, brilliant sun is on our horizon. The second line, eclipse, form, and absence. And when I say absence, I'm referring again to the quality in Buddhism we talk about as emptiness. So one of the experiences of the absolute is of a nothingness in the unmanifest absolute. But it's not a nothingness that doesn't contain anything. It isn't a kind of... Uh, it's not a lacking quality. The absence, there's nothing there, there's nothing in the experience, and yet it feels like something important is here. So it isn't just taking away, it's not removing in terms of absence. It is removing concept, it's removing some of the meaning that we make, it's removing our pattern of thought and concept. And that's what the absence does, is it lets us settle into the vastness of our true nature. And form is all of manifestation. All the things that are created or come into being are born. All of that is in the form world. And so in the process of awakening, we eclipse form and absence. So we step beyond the form, the normal world that we perceive, the normal self that we perceive, this body that I'm perceiving. All of that gets dropped. And we drop also the nothingness of the absolute. That's the function of awakening. Third line, no beginning, no end. In the absolute, there's no quality of time. There's just the eternal moment, the eternal now. Everything is always here all the time. When we have the deep enough realization, we really get to this point of seeing there, there literally is no beginning. There's no time when something started and there's no time when something ends. The absolute has always been in existence and always will be. It isn't subject to birth and death. And finally, the last line, sever every opinion. So every opinion we hold, it, it takes a position. We hold on to a particular thought, a particular relationship or a way of relating. And through that, we not only make meaning of the world, we also identify who we are and how we function in the world. And so when we have the opportunity and every opinion can be released or severed, we can really be in that vast freedom where we can have from the prior stanza, we can know all meaning. And that's what happens when we put down our own opinions. We find out that there's a vast intelligence at work that doesn't rely on concepts. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here and open it up for any questions and comments that you'd like to have or offer. I'm happy to hear comments about the meditation or anything I've talked about. Uh, or any questions that you might have. Hi, I hi. do. Hi, I do have a question to ask. Mm -hmm. um, even though I'm not like 
I wouldn't say I have in the past attended a 10 day will be called a Vipassana retreat. So my question, because obviously this is more more has to do with the Buddhist path. So the question that arises, I'm not awakened. But mm -hmm. if I take that path of awakening, does that imply that I am not I, whatever that I is, or the personality is not allowed to be ambitious or to have aspirations or to achieve? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in the process of awakening, the normal sense of I does drop during the period of the awakening and sometimes for a period afterwards. Uh, normally, people with a first awakening, it's not so deep that all sense of the self stays away permanently. It returns. And so there's still a directive. We still have a need to do all the things we do in life. In other words, we're not going to become a zombie or become completely unmotivated. But the motivation isn't just from the perspective of the self, of a kind of selfish uh, drive or do or ambition. It becomes more general in the sense of how can we be a benefit to other beings too? So we include that, we begin to include that in our perspective on what kind of work we want to do, what kind of life we want to have. Okay. And does that, does a sense of um, awakening, uh, because I, I think like Eckhart Tolle talks about <clears throat> association with the form and then the ego drops, is the awakening that um, you are referring to, is that mean the ego drops, like we become egoless or? T temporarily, the sense of self, <coughs> how, who I take myself to be drops. And we're left, we're left with the, the vastness of the absolute. And so there's a particular experience of it that people have that is one that we can, um, it can be confirmed by a teacher who's had the experience. But typically within the awakening, there's three qualities that I look for. The first is a deep experience of absence of self, meaning that the normal sense of self is suspended. Then there is typically a, a deep unity experience. So uh, an all is one, everything is the same fabric of oneness, something like that. And then also there's the recognition that our true nature is our true identity. So it's not just seeing our true nature. It's not just witnessing the absolute here. It's that aha moment of that's who I really am. So that's all part of the experience. And these aren't necessarily delineated like I'm explaining them. They sort of happen simultaneously and together. So, um, but those and, are the qualities of awakening. And this this process of awakening, um, is it uh, like a scary process where um, they, well, in some traditions, I think when they talk about Kundalini or the catharsis or that, I mean, is, is this, is it like you just go through the meditation practices and it just happens gradually, organically? Uh, how does it, how does it work or how does it feel? Mm -hmm. I guess my questions are more cerebral because I tend to be cerebral, but uh, I'm asking because I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the experience of awakening is one that can happen uh, when someone is meditating. It generally tends to happen more often when someone is not meditating and they are moving throughout their regular life. And there just is a moment when the sense of self, um, as Zen Master Dogen said, the body and mind fall away. So any sense of the body, any sense of identity drops, but we're not a, a, a blank. It's that that's where the love comes in and true nature presents. So we get to see who we really are. And rather than it being a, a horrific event, it's a really beautiful experience. But leading up to it, people have to work with 
their fear of loss of the personality, even though the personality isn't lost in a first awakening, it's just suspended for a period of time. The fear is I'm going to be lost. I'm going to cease to exist in some way that I know myself. Yeah, well, I ask, I want to ask you one final question. You are awakened, um, seemingly. So do you not uh, perceive yourself to have a personality? Uh, that really depends. There's levels of awakening. There's uh, ways that the personality becomes to be in service to true nature. So we can still be personal, personable, contactful, have intimate relationships, all of that, and not have the same sense of a self or personality. We don't believe it in the same way if it does function. And at some point it does shift and some other things begin to function in its place. If, okay, if it's deep enough, you're welcome. I'm going to ask Lupko to uh, unmute. Okay. My question, my question is about uh, kind of a new business of awakening to um, something called biomedicine or different drugs. Mm -hmm. um, what is your view about um, awakening through these means, maybe just a taste of it? Yeah, um, it's a definitely a relevant question for today as a number of these drugs, particularly the psychedelics are being used for treating depression and anxiety and other factors. Um, my experience of students doing the drugs and claiming a transcendent experience is limited. There's been a handful of people. And what I would say is that I have of them is uh, that they may have had an experience, but it feels very opaque. It feels cloudy rather than clear. When someone has an awakening without drugs, there generally is a quality of clarity that's present in the field. So that's really all I can say about it. I'm, I don't have an opinion that it's it doesn't work or does work. Uh, I just don't know very much about it. So that's my answer. And maybe just, uh, <clears throat> just, just what, did, what does your intuition tell you about uh, like using these means or these, these medicines just to kind of get a taste of that feeling? Because the, the process seems like it's, you know, it usually takes years and a lot of practice and maybe it can be um i don't know i don't know if simplified or it can be sp sped up by mm -hmm. um, by this yeah that's some of the theory behind it i know there are folks who are experimenting with this and doing various tests and things as i say my experience of students doing these is very limited so i i don't usually offer an opinion for that reason um but the people i've ex i've interacted with who claimed uh, an experience, an awakening experience or something like that, uh, I can feel that there's some depth, but it's just, it's, it's foggy, it's fuzzy, it's not clear and crisp. So again, that, that's all I can comment on. That's my only felt sense of these folks. So it's an individual choice what you do. I don't, I don't recommend it. I have students who are in therapy who are doing micro doses of this and that, which are helping with depression and anxiety. So um, again, it's, it's really outside my knowledge base. Okay. Gabby? I'm glad you mentioned today uh, visual meditators, because I am. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually enjoy that better because I feel like I'm able to reach my source better. And um, okay. and I don't know why I always try to find answers in my meditations. Um, I, I get a, like today, for instance, it's happened before, like I see like blue, uh, purple light shining, like a shining shower, which feels really mm -hmm. good. And then green, yellow light. I don't know if that means you're in some state, but mm -hmm. then the cloud was very much filled with love but that cloud was somewhere in the universe um okay 
And I always find and try to seek answers. Like one of them, my questions has always been, and I don't know that comes up in meditation or students that like, um, like this world was not meant to be this way, right? That question that comes up to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it was meant to be a different way. And I don't know if just me being in denial of the way things are. Mm -hmm. or have been from the from my recollection of studying history about this world which i don't like right mm -hmm, <laughs> um, right well like you mentioned today like the likes and don't likes just the identity of self and i'm wondering with all this that i'm experiencing am i experiencing identifying with me or am i trying to find answers to that source that that was meant to be from the beginning of this world? Yeah. Well, my, my view is the world is exactly as it needs to be because the conditioned world, the normal world we live in, is one that contains pleasure and pain. And if we didn't have pleasure to seek and pain to avoid, we wouldn't go through the discomfort, the suffering of human life and that what we call dukkha in Buddhism. And that dukkha is what propels the vast majority of people to practice, to begin a spiritual practice or meditation practice. And that ultimately is the path that we follow to realization and awakening of the absolute in this location. Mm. You recommend just keep reaching to the source just to be at ease whatever well, that is well i i'd say do do meditations that your teacher is recommending and supporting and i'm also a big advocate of working one-on-one -on -one with a teacher somebody who can get to know you and your practice your life and then can help offer guidance and clarity and interpretation mm -hmm. for what's happening yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Nancy? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good. So as you were speaking about the absolute, I was raised in a Christian tradition mm -hmm. uh, in childhood. And it kept sounding like what I heard God described as or, you know, I kept thinking, what is the difference in, in my Buddhist practice of the last, I don't know, 30 years? I've been told that in the suttas that the Buddha was asked twice about God. Mm -hmm. And he said, basically, I don't know, meditate, and you'll find out for yourself, something like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I wondered if you... Do you know, is there a, is there a parallel or is it comparable? Yes. <laughs> God, God, God is the absolute. The absolute is God. And when we talk about this pure love we were making contact with, that's typically what people experience uh, when they die. That's that that tunnel, that light they get attracted to, and the sense of these loving relatives or friends awaiting, that's the pure love they're feeling. Yes. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Armin? Yes. I was listening to the public radio the other day. The program was Hidden Brain. Mm-hmm. And it was a beautiful program. Anyway, we're talking about the the self and whether or not some animals have the sense of self or not. Right, right. The question was, well, how old is uh, even self for Homo sapiens? And uh, the guest scientist was saying somewhere around 200,000 years or something. What's your take on that? Is I can't comment on historically how long we've had a sense of self. What I will say is, at least in in Buddhism and the Mahayana tradition, it's viewed that all beings, all sentient beings, have the capacity to be realized. 
but a dog waking up to their dog nature is not the same as a human because we do have that frontal lobe we do have the sense of self where the dog just is so they're in some ways a little closer than we are but you know what i say to people is you really need to have a clear sense of identity of who you are because until you have clarity about who you are it's very difficult to transcend so you have to know what's being dropped temporarily in order to drop it temporarily. Thanks. You're welcome. Ole or Oli? Oli. Oli. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Third time's the charm. Thank you for <laughs> being here. I got a lot out of your uh, presentation some months ago, a lot out of this one. But during the course of the meditation and your discussion, I was thinking of the Tao. I've been doing some reading on the concept of the Tao. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wait a minute, there's some parallels here, but I'm certainly sure. not knowledgeable enough to talk about it. Do you have any thoughts you could share, please? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think all religions and spiritual traditions as long as people are not being harmed, are valid paths to the source. Whatever we call the source, whatever steps there are on the path, they all get to the same place. Krista. No um, I have a question about how to, um, or whether it's even appropriate to discuss these sorts of concepts or <laughs> lack thereof um, with children um, or young people. I imagine, mm -hmm. you know, they're still developing a sense of the self that then they're going to try to get rid of. Or, <laughs> mm -hmm. But I mean, how, how, how is it best to sort of um, maybe introduce this, some of these concepts or just the idea of, you know, maybe who we all really are, you know, collectively mm -hmm. on, in another way, uh, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think about? I think nature is the best. And are there any resources? I, I think nature is the best way to introduce this material. Since most of us have had experiences of nature, of a oneness and undividedness, that that's a great way for kids to make contact, for them to understand how all of this is living and we're a part of it in an undivided way. But I think you're right. They need time to establish who they are in order to, uh, again, practice and open to being who they truly are. Okay. So um, it probably, I mean, I, I'm sure there's not one specific age where <laughs> you can flip the switch, but um, generally speaking, do you think a person would sort of need to move into maybe their Mm, at least over to 20 years old or so to even try to attempt to begin a path in this way? I, I would say it's probably possible um, when one is a, um, a, you know, middle range teenager, 15, 16, up to maybe 19 or 20, somewhere in there, there seems to be enough mm -hmm. landedness in the personality to be able to work with it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Rick? Now first, I, I want to thank you very much. Um, I participated in uh, a couple of your sessions over the period of the last year or two. And it, it's always uh, a unique and, and really wonderful experience to, to spend time um, with your guided meditation and with this community. Um, so I have two questions. One is, is it possible to achieve this deep sense of connectedness with this source? Um, you know, because it's easy for me to, or it's become easier for me to kind of get a sense of that in a 30 minute session or 35 minute session sitting with you in this community but it's really difficult to 
to actually get a direct experience of that in the workaday world. And, and I'm wondering, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's a more practical question for, you know, we all, many of us live very busy lives. There's a lot of pressures, a lot of demands on us, a lot of metrics by which we're being measured by. What's the best way to kind of step into this experience? I mean, you know, maybe I've already answered the question, you know, try to sit mm -hmm. a couple times a day or at least once a day for 15 or 20 minutes, maybe in the morning or in the evening. Would that be a reasonable recommendation? Yeah, I, th I think certainly to start with sitting once or twice a day makes a lot of sense. The other thing is really continuity. It's really staying with whatever practice you're doing off the cushion. And as lay people, most of our life is spent off the cushion. So we want to have support there. I've, I've been a fan of using a pocket timer I got on, on Amazon that goes in my pocket and it vibrates for about two seconds based on what time I set. And I set it every 14 minutes when I'm uh, wanting to develop either a new practice or go deeper with the practice I'm doing. And then throughout the day, this thing is buzzing in my pocket, reminding me to come back to whatever practice I'm doing. And I find within a couple of days, I generally am pretty connected to the practice where I don't need the buzzer for a while. So there's ways that you can do things that will support your practice, but, but learning to practice off the cushion Again, that ceaseless practice is terribly important uh, for really taking the path as deeply as it's available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my qu second question is, I think all of us want to be happy. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, a, that's kind of a primary driver for, for many people, and it certainly is for myself. And, you know, in our sort of, celebrity driven world, uh, the Taylor Swifts and the Steph Curry's and the Elon Musk's. I don't know these folks, um, but they certainly seem to have achieved many, many great things, you know? And um, they seem to be very happy, but I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, <laughs> Yeah, the, the probability of me becoming uh, like a musk is just absolutely zero. That's mm -hmm. just not going to happen in my case. That's just not part of my DNA. So that's probably not, you, you know, in the cards for me to achieve happiness like that. Right. You know, by um, inventing things, um, <laughs> you know, every week or so. So I, I guess I'm wondering, is this type of practice a way that, you know, more normal, more um, kind of average person can actually achieve something great? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's really what I'm asking. Is, is greatness, um, is that available, you know, to really all of us through this, this type of teaching? It is. And it really, there becomes, you know, like the practice we did, the innate goodness practice, is a tremendous practice. Uh, I've got students doing it daily, as I do. And it just invites a kind of buoyancy and lightness within. And that alone helps navigate life and the difficulties of being a layperson in a human world around other humans. So that that really can afford and help us in that regard. But really what happens as we practice more deeply is we begin to orient towards truth. Mm. And truth really becomes the lens that's so important, where if we look at something in our life, and we just ask that question is, you know, is this true? Is this truth in what we're doing? And it really helps us begin to dist distinguish what's really constructed out of concept and thought and pattern behavior and what's unconditioned, what's uh, without birth or death that's true, that's here. 
And so the more we, we make contact with that, with the absolute, the more we can rest in it and the more we can be quite happy because we are resting in the deepest truth there is. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you again for tonight's meditation. I really appreciate it. Good, good. I'm really glad it worked for you. Annie? It doesn't want me to talk. Now there you are. <laughs> now I am. Thank you for your teachings and thank you for taking my question. Uh, my experience uh, has uh, been with uh, the Kaju School of Tibetan Medicine. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, um, uh, Buddhism <laughs> and uh, starting in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, you just mentioned something about seeing the white light uh, and uh, how do you uh, think uh, the, a reconciliation between what you just described and the bardo and the description of the bardo and the stages of the bardo, uh, the death bardo mm -hmm. until there is reincarnation. Uh, how the, the, is it a matter of mind training uh, uh, during uh, waking uh, our lives in order to regulate what bardo you go through, whether it's a white light and, and the Christian notion, Judeo-Christian notion, or, uh, or something else? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm generally familiar with the bardo process, not specifically, and I've, I've done some Tibetan Buddhist practice, typically the Dzogchen and Rigpa practice, but I don't know much beyond that. So I really can't comment on bardos. I'm not, I'm not skilled enough in Tibetan Buddhism to uh, equate that. Uh, what I can say is that uh, I believe there are bardos which are generally translated, as I understand it, as in-between states, and that we can have those uh, bardo while we are in human form. I mean, certainly everyone here has had experiences of going through a hell realm, going through a heavenly realm, going through an animal realm in the various experiences of life that we've had. So to me, there, there is a application to our everyday life that we can look at as well, as well as refining ourselves for the process of transitioning from living to not living. May I ask another question? Sure. Um, with uh, age, uh, <laughs> things uh, escape, escape uh, one. How important or is it important uh, to take one's practice into dreaming, into sleep? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know the Tibetan practice, they have the dream yoga practices that they do. And I think they're tremendous practices. I've done a few of those. Um, I, I do think that as we go deeper in our practice, we do begin to practice in the dream world or practice while we're sleeping. And so I think that does happen naturally. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, it's a more complicated answer than I can give, but but I do think there's benefit to that. Um, if someone's drawn to it, if they're attracted to it, then I think they can pursue that in lucid dreaming if that's of interest. Thank you very much. I have many more questions, but uh, I will not be a hog. Thank yeah, you. We're almost out of time. Uh, so I'll take two more and then I've got one short thing to share. Linda? Hello. Hi. Hi, you can hear me. That's good. Well, I right away, I'm going to say what a treat to have uh, uh, been in your presence tonight. Uh, that was lovely meditation. Um, I'm relatively new to meditation. And I was just kind of wondering if I was going to be able to, to comprehend some of the things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I was wondering about was you mentioned um, about opinions and certainly we live it in times and certainly over the last two years, I've become very aware of differences of opinion and how you handle them. Mm -hmm. And I, 
the, the what happened to me was um, <clears throat> in 2020, I spent five months in the hospital and um, was very close to dying uh, and a lot of uncertainties. And through that time, I um, started to explore some of the things I always had questions about. Uh, as a Christian, I had always felt that there were boundaries that I was afraid to press out of. And I started to push those out and do a lot more reading uh, through other spiritual teachers. But anyway, I probably am getting a little bit off, off tangent here. So coming back to it, one of the things that I'm really find intentional I enjoy intentionally sort of discarding a lot of things before I go out the door in the morning to try and be more present for the people that I meet and certainly through the last two years there's been divisions within families on opinions and as a family member I'm wanting to be more authentic and trying to understand how it is I can hold an opinion that is different than my family's mm -hmm. without being offensive. Does that? Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it makes sense. And, and I think a lot of it comes down to that we have to be willing to respect other people's opinions even if we don't understand them. I think we need to give a kind of credibility that from their worldview, from their life experience, this is what makes the most sense. And so rather than see it as absolute, to really see it as it's, it's relative based on our life experience and how we view the world and ourselves. So, I think having more understanding of the other yeah. is quite useful. Yeah, I understand that. That that's you know spend a lot of time listening. Mm -hmm. um, I guess just how to ex you know how to respond in a way that they can understand that 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 it's okay. I like to think of my opinions as being rather plastic or stretchable mm -hmm. because they're always okay. you know they can change but to get that to be able to put that across mm -hmm. um i suppose it's again as i said before i'm uh make it a practice every morning to do a meditation and, and just to um sort of go out naked if you wish mm -hmm. uh leaving a lot of my uh, old self down so that I can hear people and sure. uh, sort of less, less opinionated. Yeah, it makes sense. We really need to build common ground. So mm -hmm. if you can find common ground with people, start with that. Yeah, right. And then the places where you're going to be very divergent, just have an agreement to disagree rather than needing to go in and state positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I read about somewhere recently about, um, you know, setting up the guidelines that it's, mm -hmm. you know, certainly reasonable to approach that because what is your purpose is to, to be able to bind and come together again. Right. And, and to right. make that your goal. Right, it's to meet, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, thanks well, for your question. Thank you so much. Uh, just to have a quick announcement, and then um, I'll see if I can take a couple more questions. If you want to find more about me, my website is awakeningdharma.org. And uh, I next year I'm doing four in-person, five in-person retreats. The first is in Croatia in April for two weeks. The first week will be concentration practice, so breath awareness. The second week will be awakening practices, so that'll be a very potent retreat. There's only about three spots left in that one, I'm told. And they'll be doing four retreats at Cloud Mountain in uh, Washington State here in the States. 
next year and you can look up on their website or my website about that if you wish um, i mentioned my books they're all available on amazon um, and also i'm in the process actually of fundraising to develop a meditation center uh, i've been fortunate to raise money so far but i'm still um, not quite there to get a place i'd like to be able to teach a couple of weeks of retreats each month and do some other teaching. So that's kind of the next big step.